I've made a lot of videos about custom building gaming PCs at a $200 price range with varying levels of results. But what if you don't want to do the legwork yourself? Is buying a $200 gaming PC online from a friendly builder worth your hard earned money? I mean, it was hard enough to get to that price point when we were buying everything ourselves. How bad could a purchased $200 gaming PC be? Well, spoiler alert, I bought one. So let's go over how much PC you can expect for only $200 and if I think it's a good idea. Maybe you can even find one from the sponsor of this video, Jawa.gg. If you are looking to upgrade your setup or find the perfect hardware at great prices, then look no further than the sponsor of this video, Jawa. Jawa is the number one gaming marketplace to buy and sell gaming gear and get fantastic custom PCs at any budget. It's a safe and trusted platform to buy and sell hardware to a community of other PC gamers where you can find basically any component you need. Graphics cards, CPUs, motherboards, and even cases are all available at pretty great prices. I've been using Jawa for a number of years now, and I can personally say I've had a lot of great experiences on there, not only with buying and selling, but also with the customer support. And if you just wanna buy a pre-built PC, but don't wanna spend a ton of money at a retail store, Jawa has literally hundreds of pre-builds that are super affordable from the community of builders. So if you wanna start saving money on your hardware, Use the link in the video description to check jawa.gg out and use my code Jason10 to get $10 off your first order. That's J-A-S-O-N-1-0 to get $10 off. And thanks again to Jawa for sponsoring this video. Now, if you're searching through popular system integrators like iBuyPower, Dell, or NZXT, then you straight up won't find a gaming PC for $200. They have to make a profit and are primarily looking to sell brand new equipment. But by searching around your local Facebook marketplace or jawa.gg, you can definitely find someone selling an older or refurbished gaming PC for that $200 price point. But let's be realistic. You probably won't get a warranty, you aren't getting new components, and you probably aren't playing at insane frame rates or high resolutions. But you can certainly find a gaming PC that will at least get you started and play most games reasonably at 1080p, hopefully. Now I scoured a little bit online and I found quite a bit of gaming PCs under that $200 price point and picked one that wasn't necessarily the best bang for the buck, but it seemed interesting and it was actually in an ITX form factor. This PC was listed for $200 with free shipping and came to my door a few days later. I didn't record the opening, but it was well packed and I didn't find any physical damage on the device. The first thing you probably notice is that this PC is in a strange case and form factor. Well, this case is actually from Fractal Design a company that is famous for making just really quality cases. It's the Node 202 and was primarily used for making HTPCs or home theater PCs. So the form factor is very similar to a console or an audio box and would fit perfectly in basically any entertainment system. The case had a few scratches and smudges, so it definitely had a long life before getting into my hands, but it was still in pretty good condition, all things considered. There are some rubber feet missing from the case, which isn't that big of a deal, but that would hurt the overall airflow since there's less room underneath for cool air to come into. I didn't really know what to expect at first, but after looking at the motherboard I.O., I was pretty impressed. There is a USB-C port on this thing, which is pretty unheard of from older computers and still isn't found on most budget motherboards these days. Let's take off the hood and take a look inside. The machine was mostly clean from the previous owner, but there were some parts that had a fine layer of dust which is fine by me. I'm just happy they at least tried to clean the thing. First impressions continued to be good, as I saw the brown and tan tones of a Noctua fan atop a small form factor Noctua CPU cooler. Along with Fractal, Noctua is simply famous for just making really good stuff, so I'm sure the CPU cooler will live on for years without any issues. Underneath it is that ITX motherboard we saw earlier. This is a GA-Z170N Gaming 5 from Gigabyte. It's got great I.O., built-in Wi-Fi, and looks to be a very high-quality board and the CPU inside is the i7-6700K, which is fairly old at this point, seeing as it was released in 2015, but it's still fairly powerful. It's got four cores, eight threads, and can boost up to 4.2 gigahertz, which I think is still fairly good at this price point. The motherboard also supports Gen 3 NVMe SSDs, and they have it hidden on the back of it, so it's kind of a pain in the butt to upgrade storage, but I think that's fine. This PC came with 525 gigs of fast storage from Crucial, which again, at this price point, is more than enough to get someone started. The case doesn't really have room for any hard drives, so any storage expansion would have to be done through 2.5 inch SATA SSDs. The power supply that it came with was also from Fractal, so I'm pretty sure it came with the case when they first purchased it. It's a 450 watt SFX Integra PSU, and I'm not even going to check the tier list, seeing as it's pretty old. It has all the cables we need for this rig, so if I wanted to upgrade the graphics card down the line, I would only need to worry about the wattage of the PSU to see if it was supported. 
And speaking of the graphics card, this one came with the GTX 1060, which is also a few years old at this point, but I still think it's pretty good for low budget gaming rigs. Unfortunately, this is the three gig VRAM variant as opposed to the six gig variant. So there's going to be a few games that are going to be a little limited in how far we can push this card. But hey, it's still a 1060 at the end of the day, so I'm not expecting the world. I'd say if this card was any older than this, maybe the whole machine probably wouldn't be worth it. <laughs> oh, and the PC came with 32 gigs of DDR4 RAM clocked at 2400 mega transfers per second. It's running a dual channel, and while we realistically won't see a massive performance boost if we had even half the RAM, but having 32 gigs is going to go a long way when it comes to using the PC for non-gaming reasons. So just looking at all of this, to buy it for 200 bucks, I think it was actually a pretty good deal. Sure, some of the parts are pretty old, and that GTX 1060 GPU only had three gigs of VRAM, but I'm confident the performance on this rig is going to surprise us. And I understand that not all $200 gaming PCs you find online are going to be this exact one, obviously. But I hope this video gives you an idea of what kind of performance you could expect for $200. If it's way better than this, then you got a great deal. If it's much worse, well, I'd reconsider purchasing it then. And just for sanity's sake, I replaced the thermal paste on the CPU and made sure the machine was squeaked clean before putting it through some benchmarks. Now obviously all of the tests are done at 1080p resolution with varying levels of graphics intensity. Let's get started. Let's start easy with Grand Theft Auto V, since it's actually a game that came out around the same time as some of the components in this machine. Running the CAN benchmark at 1080p resolution with the graphics setting at very high, this machine was able to average around 150 FPS. Pretty great performance for people who still play this game regularly, especially in modded servers. The temperatures of the CPU and GPU were also pretty good, never really getting over 8 degrees Celsius on either of them. Fortnite is one of those games that is both easy to run and kind of difficult to run, so I was really eager to see how well it performed in this configuration. I ran it on DX11 with settings all pretty much set to low and the view distance set to near. And during an entire no-build game, I averaged around 117 FPS. There were some points where my 1% lows got really bad depending on what was around me, but I still managed to get second place in a round of no build and I'd say with some tweaking and tinkering, I wouldn't mind playing this game on it for the long term. Horizon Zero Dawn is still a beautiful single player experience even to this day. Running the CAN benchmark at 1080p resolution and using the favored performance preset, we averaged 67 FPS throughout the entire run. And for me, playing a game like this, I only expect 60 FPS. And as long as that is pretty stable and it looks pretty good, Horizon Zero Dawn would be pretty amazing on my living room TV with controller in hand. Hitman World of Assassination is still really fun to this day, and the game will run just fine on some lower end machines. At 1080p, with everything set to either low or medium, we averaged around 62 FPS in the CAN benchmark test. Another single player experience that really is totally playable at 60 FPS and looks great. The 1% lows in this were again a slight issue, and I can't help but wonder if those would be better if we had the higher VRAM variant of this card, but sometimes you have to play the cards you're dealt with. For me though, I'd still rather average 60 FPS with some slightly bad 1% lows than ever set it to a locked 30, but this is totally just my opinion. Either way, it's still totally playable. Let's round out these benchmarks with Red Dead Redemption 2, a gorgeous single player game that is still demanding by modern standards. I ran the canned benchmark at 1080p on low-ish settings and averaged around 86 FPS. I guess this game is just highly optimized because that is a lot better than I expected. The 1% lows could be slightly better, but dang, this game looks good and plays really well, even on this budget machine. I could always turn on FSR if I wanted some extra frames, but I think this would be perfect as is. And last, but of course not least, is the tried and true Cyberpunk 2077. The canned benchmark is great on this game and we needed a little bit of help with the graphics, so I decided to turn on FSR 3 to see how good we can do. 1080p, lowish settings, and FSR turned on, we averaged around 64 FPS with 1% lows of 47. This is pretty amazing stuff considering we are only rocking 3 gigs of VRAM on this GPU. I usually advise against using FSR at 1080p, but they must have done something special because using it here and checking out the benchmark, I don't see any of the smearing or smushiness I used to see when using FSR at this resolution. It looks pretty great. The frame rate is exactly where I want it for a single player experience, and we didn't spend an insane amount of money to get there. Pretty fantastic. So this $200 PC might not be the creme de la creme. I think for the price and form factor though, it performed about what I expected. Good frame rates at 1080p in every game, even if we aren't going to infinity and beyond. Now the question still stands, do I recommend buying a $200 gaming PC? Well, it obviously depends on what exactly is in the machine. As long as the parts make sense, and the machine looks like it was taken care of well, I'd say go for it. But if it were me, here's what I'd do. I'd buy a gaming PC like the one I bought here today. 
take that GTX 1063 gig, sell it for $45, and then go buy an RX 588 gig for $50. That would bring the total cost of the PC probably to more like $210. But I think to get triple the VRAM and even better frame rates on basically every game, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? So what does that all mean? Well, if you're in the market for a $200 gaming PC, I'm going to assume you are probably pretty new to this hobby and just looking to get your feet wet. Use that PC as a stomping ground. Just because you buy a PC doesn't mean it needs to stay that way forever. Learn the ins and outs of the hardware and the software. Feel free to make small upgrades here and there just to get comfortable with the whole process. Make it your own by painting the outside or using a vinyl wrap. There's no reason why a $200 gaming PC needs to stay exactly the same way as you bought it. So just do your research, look around on sites like jawa.gg, and turn that $200 gaming PC you buy into your personal project. But if you'd still prefer to custom build a $200 gaming PC, you can check out these two videos where I show you from the ground up all the components I bought to assemble a budget gaming PC. Please like the video if you liked it, and thanks to everyone for getting the channel to 20,000 subscribers. Drop a cat emoji in the comments if you made it this far so I know who the real homies are. My name is Jason. Thanks for watching. You're distracting. <laughs>